Hello and welcome to another episode of Humans in Five. We thought that in today's Materials and Methods episode, we'd shine a light on the work that our colleagues do in primatology. As we mentioned a few episodes back, primatology is a branch of biological anthropology and focuses on studying the biology, behavior, and evolution of our primate cousins, including apes, monkeys, lemurs, eyes, and a whole range of others. So why is it so important to study non-human primates? Like any other species on the planet, they are part of multiple ecosystems, and their presence is central to the survival of animal diversity on this planet. They're also our closest living relatives. There's a wealth of information present in living and extinct primates that can tell us about human behavior and evolution. When it comes to studying primates, there are three main approaches. The first is field-based study, where primatologists travel to areas where wild primates live and study them there. The second is laboratory-based study, where researchers observe primate behavior and biology in more controlled settings. The last is known as semi-free ranging, where primates live in a captive setting, like a zoo or a reserve, but live in a similar way to their wild counterparts. One of the most popular areas of study for primatology is primate behavior. This can occur in wild, captive, and laboratory settings, and includes the use of a huge range of skills and equipment. As with many other research fields, studying behavior starts with being aware of our own human behaviors first. For primatologists working in the field, this means they have to consider how habituated a primate group is to the presence of humans. Habituating primates happens when a researcher carefully presents themselves repeatedly over a specific period of time to accustom the primates they're observing to their presence. Researchers are not trying to integrate themselves into the primate group, but asking permission from the primates to observe them. This is a complex process and will change not only for each species, but also for each community within a species. Once a primate group is habituated, researchers can begin recording ape or monkey behavior, often using continuous or scanned sampling. This involves focusing on one or more individuals in the group, setting a timer, and noting the actions, interactions, or location of primates during that set time. Cameras can also be used to film behavior alongside notes made by researchers. Depending on the study, researchers also have to learn to identify each individual in a group. A challenge when you're observing a group of between 11 to 7 ring-tailed lemurs, for example. Of course, it isn't all about behavior. There's plenty that we can learn about primate biology and evolutionary history from one very important, although smelly, primate product. Primate poo. Poop science, as it's known informally on Twitter, happens when researchers pick up droppings from different species of primate and take them back to their labs. Primate poo can tell us about the uh, diet and health of individual primates, but it can also tell us about hormone levels and genetic relationships. For example, levels of cortisol, a hormone related to helping the body deal with stress, can be identified from a poop sample, which will tell researchers about social rank in a primate group and how this changes with different individuals in a group. Gathering information on primates is certainly fascinating, but it is not without its problems. Primates live in some of the most politically unstable parts of the world, and many researchers experience dangerous situations in the course of their work. Added to that, Primate habitat is disappearing all across the world, leading researchers to compete with different industries to protect primate groups. We hope that this episode shows you that primatology isn't just about monkeying around, and we'll see you next time on Humans in Five. And don't forget to subscribe.